tonight on the ground in Jamaica. Canadian forces training troops ahead of a security support mission in Haiti. Preparing soldiers who will try to keep the peace. We've got an awful lot of experience in nation building, peacekeeping. Canada's commitment to a UN mission. Making way for a million visitors ahead of a total solar eclipse. The state of emergency um, from a technical perspective allows us to have all tools at our toolbox. The proactive approach drawing criticism. Plus a master class in paying it forward. We can start to give something to local community. Ukrainian newcomers on lessons of language and culture. CTV National News with Heather Butts. Good evening. We begin tonight with the Canadian training operation in Jamaica. Dozens of Armed Forces members have been deployed to support soldiers who will then head to Haiti to bolster the National Police in their efforts to restore security. It's part of Ottawa's agreement to this multinational mission. CTV's Colton Prale starts us off. Canada's military is expanding its role in the response to the Haitian crisis. 70 CAF members deployed to Jamaica yesterday on a month-long mission to train more than 300 soldiers from Jamaica, the Bahamas and Belize in peacekeeping skills and first aid. Canadians are, are good at doing that. They will help them uh, and give them the skill sets in uh, the hard edge of uh, establishment and also uh, first aid where unfortunately they're probably going to have to use. The operation is part of the more than $120 million Canada committed to supporting Haiti in February. But Ottawa made no further mention of the deployment until troops were in Jamaica. The help Haitian National Police need to regain jurisdiction in a capital overwhelmed by gang violence isn't coming fast enough. A temporary transitional council announced three weeks ago still has yet to form the interim government that would allow international military support to enter the country. This week, Canada began evacuating some of the roughly 3,000 Canadians registered in Haiti. Fewer than 100 people have asked for Ottawa's help to leave. The poor Asian population is paying a very big price for the, uh, the kind of... of uh, gridlock that this country is facing. Those delays fueling major political tensions in Kenya, where opposition parties are pushing government to renege on a commitment to send a thousand Kenyan police officers to lead international efforts in Haiti. It's been controversial uh, in terms of an intervention because it's guaranteed to, there are guaranteed to be casualties. There's guaranteed to be a uh, loss of life. This week, Haiti's Transitional Presidential Council released its first public statement, promising a clear path to public order, something that will continue to be delayed as international personnel remain sidelined. Heather. Thanks, Colton. And while the Foreign Affairs Minister keeps an eye on Haiti, she has the other on the Middle East. Melanie Jolie got into an argument on the street this weekend about the Israel-Hamas war. Melanie Jolie. Lift the cap on the number of Palestinian refugees. Lift the cap. No, cap. No, man, I thought so. I thought... Jolie was out for a walk in Montreal when a man confronted her. She tries to snatch his camera away. The man accuses her of attacking him and tells her to let in more Palestinian refugees. Jolie then says she's working on it, but that she's also trying to enjoy her walk. In a statement, Jolie's office says the minister always welcomes conversations, but that in this case, it's clear this interaction began with the intention to startle her for the purpose of a social media clip, not a constructive conversation. Truce talks are set to resume in Cairo tomorrow between Israel and Hamas, days after the United Nations Security Council issued its first demand for a ceasefire. But as pressure continues to mount for both parties to find peace, the United States is reportedly sending more weapons to Israel. CTV's Kamal Karamali reports. Today, unverified claims Israeli Defense Forces killed Hamas fighters at Al-Shifa Hospital during an ongoing raid and also while it dropped bombs in the Gaza Strip. Now a new commitment from the U.S. for billions of dollars more 
in weapons. Alarming news for human rights groups. They are using explosive weapons in populated areas in ways that are expected to cause massive civilian casualties. America's new arms package to Israel includes more than 1,800 2,000 pound bombs, 500 500 pound bombs, 25 fighter jets, all part of the nearly 4 billion U.S. dollars in military assistance Washington gives Israel every year. A 2,000 pound bomb hitting the, uh, you know, a multi-story structure, structure will flatten that structure. So it, it's devastating. The weapons transfer comes just a day after U.S. President Joe Biden acknowledged the pain being felt by many in the Arab American community. What about the health care? And the same week he said this to pro-Palestinian protesters. They have a point. We need to get a lot more care into the Gaza. Little of that care has been getting through. 400 tons left for the enclave today. Unclear, though, when that would reach the starving population. More than 32,000 have been killed, according to Hamas health authorities in Gaza. Biden has been facing increasing pressure from Arab leaders and members from his own party to cut military aid. It would send a very clear message that the Israeli military needs to obey the law and protect civilians in Gaza. And because of that growing pressure, analysts believe that the delivery of weapons will come with some conditions attached, conditions that may include a temporary ceasefire. Heather. All right, Kamal, thank you. A grim discovery at the Canada-U.S. border. Two migrants were found dead on the New York side. U.S. border officers patrolling the woods near Roxham Road found their bodies buried in snow. The men froze to death. They were both 25 and from Senegal. It's unclear whether they were coming or going from Canada. In Baltimore today, crews started cutting and hauling away the first bits of mangled steel from the bridge that collapsed earlier this week. The daunting cleanup is made all the more difficult by dangerous debris, sharp metal and electrical wires. Six construction workers were killed when a container ship lost power and rammed into the bridge. And we're hearing tonight from one of the last drivers to cross it. If I had been one minute later, I probably wouldn't be here. It's just like, you know, it's, it's very scary. There's still no timeline on when the port of Baltimore, a major shipping hub, will reopen. A commitment from Ottawa today to give more women the freedom of choice through free contraceptives. The announcement in Toronto is just the latest in the Liberals' messaging campaign ahead of Budget Day. Here, CTV's Jeremy Charon. A champion of women's freedom of choice. It's not a new promise, but a renewed push from Ottawa today to put its pharmacare plan back in the spotlight. The cost of prescription drugs has been a challenge and a barrier for too many Canadians. People shouldn't have to choose between paying for their medication and putting food on the table. Inside this Toronto pharmacy, Associate Health Minister Yara Sachs joined by Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland, pledging to cover the cost of contraceptives. In the upcoming federal budget, we will be delivering free contraceptives through our national pharmacare plan. The government predicts it could help eliminate barriers for 9 million Canadian women. Too many women slip through the cracks, that there are simply too many obstacles for them to overcome to obtain contraception, and so they just give up. The plan will cover a list of common contraceptives, including the birth control pill, IUDs, and emergency contraceptives, methods costing between $100 and $500 per year or unit. A next step in this plan that is going to help make life cost less for young Canadians. This announcement, the latest in a string of budget previews. We're not going to have a budget day. We're going to have budget days. It's like liberal Lent. Instead of giving something up, though, you get something for day after day after day. A new liberal marketing strategy aimed at regaining ground in the polls, say experts speaking with CTV's question period. I think it is a defensive strategy against the Conservatives. So the Liberals are openly saying they're going after younger voters. The plan will see most of the upcoming federal budget announced before it's tabled in the House of Commons mid-April. It's of course not yet clear whether the pre-budget political tactics will work. What is clear, Heather, is the Liberals are trying something new. Jeremy Sharon in Ottawa, thank you. A shrimp plant in Quebec burned to the ground overnight. 
Smoke and flames forced people near the building in Matan out of their homes. No one was hurt. No word yet on what caused the fire, but the investigation was turned over to the major crimes unit. Just last week, the factory's owners announced its closing. Parts of western Newfoundland inundated with torrential rain are cleaning up from major flood damage. <laughs> In Cape St. George, a brook burst its banks, washing out a road and cutting off communities. Some homes were flooded. Several streets were also closed. A couple hours away in Corner Brook, more than 100 millimeters of rain has fallen this weekend. One of Canada's tourism hotspots is preparing for bigger crowds than it's ever seen. Niagara Falls is expecting upwards of a million visitors for a prime view of a total solar eclipse on April 8th. The regional government declared a state of emergency to prepare for the crowds, but it's a term not everyone sees eye to eye on. CTV's Tony Grace explains. The breathtaking view at Niagara Falls draws people from all over the world. This group from Italy is here early for the bonus prize on April 8th, one of the best views of a total solar eclipse in a century. My birthday and then the solar eclipse is so, so wonderful. The stars are lining up for you. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. More than 1 million visitors expected in a place that typically sees 14 million a year. At the aptly named Flying Saucer Diner, that means staffing up. We're super excited. Um, we're expecting a lot of business. Uh, we have full staff on. And serving up eclipse-themed dishes. But there's something else on the menu down here, a state of emergency. It could quite possibly be the biggest um, visitor day in Niagara's history. The region says it's a proactive move, opening up more planning powers and putting critical services on notice. Whether it be congestion of traffic, um, cellular network disruptions, um, and, and of course our emergency medical services. We want everybody to be um, on high alert. It also opens the door to ask upper levels of government for money to cover overtime costs. It's just unfortunate it had to be called a state of emergency because we don't see it as that. We see it as a, a day of celebration. Tourism operators are planning a series of evening events, hoping to prevent a mass exodus after the eclipse. We're hoping actually that that will encourage people to stay behind and not all rush for the major artery roads at the same time. Multiple police forces will converge here with officers on extended shifts. Roads will be closed. Hotels are booked solid. The stage is set for a well-attended show. We're within a day's drive of almost half the population of North America. The mayor is pleading for common sense. Be patient. There's going to be a lot of people. Leave yourself a lot of time. Nonetheless, an all-hands-on-deck approach to ensure that when two of the world's natural wonders come together, on this spot, on that day, it's an event to remember for all the right reasons. Tony Grace, CTV News, Niagara Falls. Hope is on the horizon for those with cerebral palsy after a breakthrough discovery by Montreal doctors. Tonight, a family is sharing their courageous journey marked by the power of love and unwavering determination. CTV's Matt Gilmore explains. <laughs> Sienna Zakaria is as smiley and playful as any 18-month-old. But at six months, her parents say they started noticing she wasn't hitting her milestones. She wasn't rolling. Uh, she wasn't able to support her head weight. Um, sort of like a lack of focus. She wasn't able to concentrate on her voice. Doctors determined she has a form of cerebral palsy a developmental disorder that affects her movement. So cerebral palsy is the most common cause of physical disability in childhood. And for the longest time, it, the prevalent belief was that it was caused by uh, asphyxia at birth. Dr. Miriam Oskowi is the head of neurology at the Montreal Children's and is the co-author of a groundbreaking study that shows that's not always the case. Uh, we looked to see if there was a genetic uh, cause that could explain part of their clinical presentation. It turns out in many cases, including Sienna's, a genetic mutation was actually the root cause of the disorder. It's always good to know. It sort of gives you some sort of, I guess, relief. In the end, there's nothing that can be done about it for now, but we are hopeful that the future holds something positive for us. Dr. Oskowi says the discovery could open the door to the development of new gene therapies, but there are short-term benefits as well. 
No two cases of cerebral palsy are the same. So cerebral palsy is a spectrum disorder, absolutely. If you've met one child with cerebral palsy, you've met the one child with cerebral palsy. And how you treat it depends on the individual case. Understanding the role genetics are playing will allow for better and more personalized care. So this is where precision medicine is needed and an individualized approach to what really is impacting um, their daily life. <laughs> Already through physio and occupational therapy, Sienna has gained a lot of strength. She's been able to hold her head much better than when she was younger. Um, with some minor support, she can sit up like this. But for the parents, it's been a difficult journey. She's here, she's beautiful, she's happy, she's smiley. It's the, the extra worry of not knowing what your child is. she ever going to be able to walk? Is she ever going to be able to speak? It's difficult. It has been difficult. It will continue to be difficult. Sienna is what keeps us going every day. So we, um, you know, we're very grateful, we're thankful. And uh, as I said, to us, she's perfect. Matt Gilmore, CTV News, Montreal. Coming up, filling a void. I just think it's beautiful and it's a good representation of the city of Toronto and also what we should be focusing on. Volunteers join in to help others this Easter weekend. Plus, bringing Ukrainian lessons on language and culture to Canada's East Coast. As families gather for Easter weekend, there are many struggling to put food on the table. Nonprofit food programs are expecting demand to increase by 18% this year. At Toronto's Daily Bread Food Bank, hundreds gathered today to help others. CTV's Sean Lethong has more. A flurry of activity inside the Daily Bread Food Bank as the spring sort is bringing community together. I just think it's beautiful and it's a good representation of the city of Toronto and also what we should be focusing on. It's a good way to give back to the city and to people who, uh, who need it. As dozens of volunteers sort through more than 30,000 pounds of food, people like 17-year-old Obi Anwaboku think of who they're helping. For example, when we sort the cans here, you want to make sure, see if there's a dent on it that's a little bit too... You don't want to give someone a can of tomatoes that's bad, right? Oh, it's, it's good, it's good. No, I mean, would you want to eat something that was busted open? No. So, it's kind of just, you know, Thinking of others as human beings and understanding what you're doing is not just charity. It's, you know, it's helping other people survive. And today's evidence of a difficult reality. More and more people are coming to the food bank to survive. So in February, we saw 301,000 client visits. February last year was 215,000. And pre-pandemic, it was 60,000. The way things are right now, if I didn't come here, myself and my family would probably be out on the street because it would be a choice between paying the rent or buying food. People like Sue Ellen Patchison, who has been coming to the food bank since 2021. Before the pandemic and inflation hit, we were able to make that work. Once inflation started going up, it became impossible. And as volunteers and clients work to sort food, Premier Doug Ford and Mayor Olivia Chow spoke about the cost of living crisis. No matter if it's affordable, attainable housing, or if it's just basically putting food on the table to feed their family, uh, there, there's some tough times, but we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we support the people in need. And let's use this opportunity to remember that there's always hope. But as the food keeps coming in, there are more and more clients lining up as the cost of living isn't getting better anytime soon. One statistic that speaks to the alarming rise in demand is that one in 10 people now in the city of Toronto relies on a food bank, and that's double the previous year. Sean Lethong, CTV News, Toronto. Still ahead, one man's close call. Narrow escape from a runaway saw blade. A dramatic scene in the Netherlands after a man suspected of holding four hostages for hours in a nightclub was arrested. A tense standoff ended with Dutch police detaining the man and releasing all of the hostages. Police say the hostage taker was armed with knives and reportedly threatened to use explosives. 
Police barged through the front door to raid the Peruvian president's home as part of a corruption investigation linked to a collection of undisclosed luxury watches. Authorities were searching for more than a dozen Rolex watches, allegedly not declared. And before we go to break, an extremely close call caught on camera. Watch this. A man walks into an Oregon convenience store. Seconds later, right behind him, a runaway saw blade comes flying across the parking lot. The impact was so powerful, it shook the whole store. The blade came loose at a construction site next door. Incredibly close call. After the break, calling Canada home. Ukrainian newcomers settle in with a new school. Finally, for us tonight, Ukrainian newcomers who now call Newfoundland and Labrador home are bringing a sense of their heritage to the province. The group is running weekend programs with lessons on language, history and culture. CTV's Garrett Barry on what this means for the growing community. Singing and clapping to a new tune in St. John's. For the first time, these Ukrainian families have ridden a shkola, a weekend program for school-aged children. For us, uh, it gives us feelings that we are part of this community, we can talk, we can celebrate our uh, holiday together, uh, maybe we can help each other. They'll meet every Saturday for lessons on Ukrainian language, culture, and history. In Canada, uh, you have a lot of uh, famous people with Ukrainian roots. Van Gretzky, for example. The Ukrainian population in this province is growing fast. Hundreds of Ukrainians arrived in Newfoundland in the past two years. In fact, the provincial government went to great lengths to entice them here, even organizing four flights for asylum seekers, destination St. John's. Now there are about 3,500 Ukrainians living in Newfoundland and Labrador, and many want to pay it forward. And we have many, many like, gifts from province and local people. But now, I think a big part of Ukraine Ukrainians here have a job, have a place to live, and we can start to give something to local community. These weekend schools have history across the country, and lately they've been an important link between Ukrainians fleeing the war with Russia and families who've established themselves in Canada for decades. The newcomer kids are learning in English. The kids who were born here or second or third generation are learning Ukrainian, uh, building friendships, integrating and communicating together. In St. John's, Dubik says she has a lot of plans to continue to build community infrastructure like a Ukrainian kitchen and daycare for her growing community. It's a really nice place. I never think about go and search something better, you know, like a look outer Canada. I think it's in my place. Garrett Perry, CTV News, St. John's. That's our show for this Saturday. I'm Heather Butts. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. John Ehrlichman is in for me tomorrow. I'll see you again on Monday. Wishing you and your family a happy Easter. Good night. <laughs>